So we're going to go through a, a quick project update. We're hoping to have, uh, it's going to be like a Twitter-based project update, so we're just giving you the nuts and bolts. A lot of it's been presented uh, at other opportunities. So we're going to go through quickly the night sprain project, our soil sensor project, Brassica carinata, winter wheat, hybrid fall rye, grazing winter cereals, interrow seeding, and hemp agronomy. So this is for you, Ian. Night sprain, pay attention. Just kidding. How bad of a mess did I make? So, so the night sprain project's been a lot of fun. We're actually finished the three years of work on the herbicide side of things, and you know the. The learnings have been interesting and complicated. Now, we don't have everything sorted out yet. We're still in the middle of crunching the final data to, to come up with some, some general recommendations. This is just a nice uh, drone shot of, of our, our trials where we had the mustard as our broadleaf weed in the front half of the plots, and the back half, we had our tame oats as our grassy weed. And then we had all four different crops, and then every mix of uh, herbicide mode of action that we could come up with. We had pre-seed burn down trials, and this is a very good visual. And I think the really big take home message is that you can have a significant difference in efficacy based on time of day. So our, ours were very early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, noon and midnight. That's the, the, the times that we chose. So, this is a, our shot of a day plot, early in the morning, and our night. Uh, the long and the short of it is, is that daytime is the most consistent time to spray. Now, sure, the project was called night spraying, but it doesn't mean that you should jump to the assumption that we're saying night spraying is the way to go. In fact, I think in general, the results that we've been seeing is that we have to be aware of the fact that time of day does affect the weather that affects the climate in, in, when you're spraying, and that affects the efficacy. Now, in the pre-seed burndown trials, it ranged from around 10, oops, I got rid of that slide. It, it ranged from 8% to almost 20% difference in efficacy. So that could be 70% control versus 90% control, which is really gonna matter when you're talking about weed seed bank and, and probably even yield in certain circumstances. So we tried to come up with a way that, that sort of represented the data. And, and on the pre-seed burndown time, this was, we ranked them as what was best or tied for best. And daytime was by far the most consistent results. What really surprised us more than anything was how the early in the morning application was typically the worst. And I know a lot of us are, are kind of raised, get up first thing in the morning, go spray and beat the wind. And this has been proven to be some of the, the worst results out there in almost all situations. Nighttime was sort of in between. Just to show some quick data, so the blue is the oats and the orange is the tame mustard. So as we went from daytime, we went 95 down to 89. So not a huge impact on the grassy weeds but on the broadleaf, we went from a 90% control down to 64 and 63 for both early and day. Now that's a, that's a pretty significant difference over, over three site years. Now that's my visual weed rating, so when we go out there and estimate by eye how many weeds are killed versus not. But we also have a quantitative measurement where we go in and cut the weeds, separate it from the crop and weigh it out. So it's, it's a not, not a subjective measurement. And so we did this as a percentage of the check. The check was sprayed with nothing. This is where we looked at the early treatment, 8.3% of the weed biomass. So the higher the number in the biomass side of things, that's weeds that didn't get killed. So daytime was very, very good control. Early was the worst, night was in between. That's for glyphosate. So then, okay, we're seeing these results. Time of day isn't really the, what matters. It's obviously the environmental conditions at the time of application. So we're doing a lot of analysis looking at the weather a few days before and a few days after the application periods. And I'm just throwing this up as, as an example of, of how we're comparing the results. But this is temperature in red and relative humidity in blue. And you'll notice that 
there is quite a significant pattern, and that's obviously because it heats up in the day and it cools off at night. But it actually, the coldest part of the day, you probably know, is first thing in the morning. And that's when we get the dew situations. So we hear from other parts of the world in some of our studies that people are considering this temperature and relative humidity, and they've actually combined it into a measurement. We'll skip that. That measurement is called a delta T. Now, uh, Ontario, they do this. Australia, quite a bit. And it, it, what it is is a, a way to measure the indication that when, when is it good to spray based on humidity and temperature. So they've got this definition, wet bulb temperature minus dry bulb temperature. So to explain this quickly, I had a hard time wrapping my head around this. A wet bulb temperature is if you had a thermometer and you basically had a wet paper towel around it. So that temperature is going to be different than not having that wet paper towel. You get out of the shower and stand in front of the fan, it's cold. So there's that evaporative cooling effect that happens. We also happen to have a lot of wind in southern Alberta. So picture this, this is, this is still a theory, but you've got your plants that are completely wet. The wind is blowing, so they're cold. And it actually the phase change between a liquid and a gas removes heat. So it's actually sucking heat out of that plant. And that's, that's our premise right now as to why that early morning, ap morning application is not good because the plant is actually under stress from that heat being removed. So this is, I like saying this, this is called a psychometric chart. I don't know what that means, but it sounds cool. And basically it's a map of relative humidity versus dry temperature. And there is a range that they say is acceptable for spraying between two and eight, a delta T of two and eight, I saw. Um, what happened when we analyzed all of the data from the night spraying project is our daytime applications were within that range of two to eight, which makes sense. And when we looked at the early and night, we were less than two and close to zero. So this actually agrees quite well with what's being studied in the other parts of the world. You can actually get these little kestrels now that will give you a delta T measurement. So it's just something to think about. It's not the be all and end all, but if you have particular fields where you have hard to kill weeds or for whatever reason you, you're, you're trying to do your best job, I would always recommend the daytime application. Can you do a good job early at night in certain cir circumstances? Absolutely. But uh, the long and short of it is consistency is in the day. So I'm gonna quickly rip through a precision ag project now. I, I don't think I can take any questions, so corner me afterwards because we're running a little bit behind. This was our, our study looking at the electroconductivity sensors as a tool for precision ag. It's basically a tool used to characterize the soil. So the traditional method of doing that is with soil samples, and we're doing lots of that. This field in particular is up in the Drum Heller area. Extreme variability, they've got pockets of trees and low spots, uh, you name it, really hilly. I can understand why people in that area are very interested in, in managing that variability compared to down here perhaps. But what, we, what we're trying to do with the project is also analyze these soil sensors as a useful tool, but also to help develop appropriate methods in, in both doing variable rate and on-farm research. I'm not sure that you can see it with the screen, but there's little strips here. And this was actually a, a drone picture across here where our treatments are picking up. And we just had f f five different rates of nitrogen in canola. So that's the aerial map, and that's our treatment list. And in this particular situation, we went on a diagonal with replicated research trials. We just pre-programmed the seeder to do it for him. Kind of made it simple but great way to both implement replication and randomization into a research trial. But the neat thing that we added on there was a, a spatial variation in, in, in a, a diagonal across that field. So we went with 0, 60, 90, and 120 pounds of nitrogen in this case. The yield map that came out looked like that. And then once we've cleaned the data, we have our, block, our research blocks with our treatments within it. So this, this is the results 
of that trial. So basically, this is the, the guy's developing his own nitrogen response curve spatially across the field, divided up into blocks. Now, we've averaged this on blocks A, B, C, D. It started A in the corner and D up this way. The yield went from about 50 bushels up to 58 in this response curve, and that's looking at the bottom three blocks, and this one, the response curve is a little bit different. I'm bringing this up for a reason. When we looked at the EC data, if I averaged all of the blocks, this is the response curve, which actually looked very similar to the yield curve. So I could jump to the assumption that EC is a good indicator of yield. But the problem was, when we remove that D block, look at the response curve now, and that's really what I'd expect, because the electroconductivity of the soil doesn't change with our fertilizer treatments. It really doesn't make sense that we'd see a response to it. And here's, here's, here's why. When we look at our yield based on the block, A, B, C, and D, we've got this one outlier here. That's that D block in the top right corner. So for whatever reason, these three blocks gave us reasonable data. And this fourth one was out to lunch. So if we were going to base our decisions without really taking the time to analyze the results properly, we could be jumping to the wrong conclusions quite quickly. So this is my concern over all of the talk about big data, is that big data doesn't mean big knowledge in, unless you apply it. So we have to be very cautious in this sense, and we're learning a lot of things on, on how to process this data. So this was the EC map, and you'll notice that the EC block D, so whatever happened in that top right corner of that field was really skewing the results for the rest of the field. So just a, good, a quick good example of the type of things that we're doing within that project. Mountains and mountains of data uh, will have a final report by the end of October. Raska Carinata, I'm just gonna pretty much skip over, but it's, it's fun to be part of a new crop development. These guys are making headway as a, a, and are supposed to be launching some, some actual serious acres next year. That's the Ethiopian mustard. We talked about the winter cereals. Good news is uh, Growing Forward 2 did approve more work on the winter cereal, so we'll be working with Brian Barris and Ag Canada in the next three years on, on more work on the winter cereal. A new breeder out of Lethbridge, Jamie Larson, is trying to develop hybrid fall rye, so if you guys are excited about that as a new crop opportunity. Wake up. At this point in time, I'm done, and I'm going to ask uh, Mike to step up. <laughs>